Uh, hello and welcome to another episode of Crime Pays by Bonnie Dozen. Uh, I was here in Fremont County, Wyoming on some uh, roughly oligocene, it's a yeah, maybe 30 million year old uh, uh, sedimentary deposits. Lots of uh, volcanic sediments, lots of that tophaceous stuff again. But it's really, you know, generally kind of a conglomerate uh, where we're at right now. But that mesa that you're looking at is all, uh, all the tophaceous shit. All the volcanic sediments. Real nice. Anyway, you can see it's very smoky up. It's got that kind of uh, burning newsprint, burning comic book store feeling. These fires uh, that are burning right now, I'm guessing they're probably coming from California or Oregon, proving once again that you just never truly can escape the doomed and ominous circumstance that is uh, the state of California. So their forests are burning and I'm breathing it in. But uh, it doesn't smell too bad yet, just, uh, you know, just the kind of uh, obstructing uh, visibility. You know, visibility is probably only a, a mile or two right now. Anyway, today we're going to go check out a plant that was only discovered in 1991. It's a member of the sunflower family, Asteraceae, and uh, it's only known from two populations, all in Wyoming. So this is a Wyoming endemic plant. It's rare as hell, okay? Who knows why it's so rare? Did it recently speciate? By recently, I mean in the last 50,000 to 200,000 years. Or is it a paleo endemic? Just the leftover populations from a uh, an ancestor that had a much more common range, a much more uh, wide distribution. So either way, let's go check it out. The interesting thing about this plant is that uh, what it's most closely related to is the genus Arnoglossum which is a Midwestern prairie plant. And as you can see, we are not in the prairie right now. We're in the high and dry. We're at about 6,000 feet elevation and it's very dry, okay? Most of the precipitation here comes in the form of uh, snow during winter with the occasional uh, intermittent summer thunderstorm. Anyway, let's go check it out. Here we go. Anyway, as you can see, the flora right here at the moment is not too charismatic. You got some nice uh, wild horse shit over there. Uh, we got... Uh, our old friend, uh, Aramogeny, right there. Little matted caryophyllaceous bastard. We got Phlox muscoides, the moss phlox, Polymoniaceae, and uh, a handful of other species that all maintain that kind of pincushion shape uh, growing uh, close to the desert floor. You also got, of course, your sagebrush, your Artemisia tridentata. But, uh, you know, in immediate vicinity, nothing, uh, nothing that really draws my attention. And certainly nothing flowering. So anyway, continuing on about our business of giving the landscape a rectal exam, look at the geology. You could see a mixed geology here, all just uh, presumably alluvial deposits, okay? All just uh, shit that's washed out of the surrounding mountains or been deposited uh, by some other means, probably, uh, probably stream, probably uh, just good old uh, weathering, erosion, etc. But you could see right here, we got what appears to be uh, perhaps a, a gabbro. Over here we got uh, some quartz and uh, a bunch of other shit mixed in. So just the uh, general alluvium. The tetradymia canescens is blooming, look at that. You know, a lot of composites, a lot of members of the sunflower family, these desert composites really have no trouble blooming during the hottest and driest part of the year. It's pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. Anyway, you can see there's the uh, woolly involucre, lanceolate foliage, woolly with the shit. And you can see it's just uh, just coming up, staying kind of close to the ground though, okay? Still maintaining that low form in the high and dry. You know, that, uh, that wildfire smell, I'm a little uh, little more well acquainted with it than I'd like to be. Really, it does. it's amazing how much it, it does. It smells like a burning comic book store, you know? Like someone's... Uh, Old copies of uh, X-Men from the 80s got set on fire. Look at all the Antonaria on the ground. So uh, anyway, we're going to be serenaded right now by Jack's Panting. Hope you don't mind. But let's take a look at this, uh, this member of the pea family right here. This is Thermopsis rhombifolia. Ooh, appears glaucous at first. Get close to those leaves. You could see they're a uh, little velvety on the underside as many plants are many desert plants are 
You can see that they're not flowering, not much too dry. But, uh, you know, they're doing fine here. Coming back, they can always, you know, when it gets too hot, they can just uh, die back to that uh, perennial root. Yellow flowers when they are going off. Faboidae subfamily of the pea family. Fabaceae. And, and look at this plant right here. Not flowering, not much to show you at the moment, but I'm going to show it to you anyways because it's so goddamn common, especially in dunes. And you can see all those all those glands on it. It's got a very distinct smell. Ladyania lanceolata. Okay, I was just surveying for uh, the blowout penstemon, which is uh, only known from a, a very small area in Wyoming, somewhat close to here. And this thing was everywhere. It grows on these sand dunes. The blowout penstemon does, you know, and it seems like for every 5,000 of these Ladyanias that you'll see, and they were flowering down there, and it was, they were, it was a, a, they had gotten a little bit more rain, wasn't as dry, but they were flowering down there. Tiny pea flowers, tiny like white and purple pea flowers, but for every 5,000 of these, you'd see there was only like one penstemon. So that penstemon, really cool plant, wasn't flowering, other, otherwise I would have made a video on it. But, uh, you know, worth looking up if you get the chance. The blowout penstemon, only known from Wyoming and Nebraska. And only known from dunes. But that Ladyania was everywhere down there. You find that Ladyania all on dunes, all throughout dunes of western North America. See, that's nice. They found a little spot to hide out while I'm doing my thing. It's kind of hot. I brought an umbrella for them, but they never use it. And then it just tends to blow over. So I don't even know why I brought it out now. But, you know, they found some cover. They'll be comfortable. You just sit tight. All right, I got some canned chicken for you in the bed of the truck when we get back. Anyway, let's check out this. Look, we got some nice uh, barren areas right here. You always find the interesting stuff on the barren areas. Always find the good plants. And again, that's because that's where the plants really get put to the test. Look at that ash flows, ash deposits. The tefacious shit. Ah, look at that. I love it. And we got Physaria, of course. Look at that. Look at that Physaria. Huh? Would you believe that's a member of the mustard family? I love it. Yeah, I never get tired of seeing Physarias. I really never do. Look at that matted bastards. So many little uh, pin cushions, little carpets, little Sespitosa balls of carpeting. You know, I can't believe people were still using carpeting in homes. You know, and I'm no interior designer, but it's real. It's it's a filthy thing, all right? And then you're just neurotic about spilling stuff on it the whole time. The whole time it's just harboring dust mites. Oh, look at that. Got an Ariagonum. There's that little Fizaria again. Thermopsis. Look at that, look at his flocks. Look at the, the moss flocks. Flocks muscoides. You could just see the little calyx left over. Must have been nice and bloom. Look at how reduced those leaves are. They're just, just these little decussate bracts almost, they look like. Just making a nice little ball. Nice little softball on the uh, volcanic ash. Got some Ivesia gordonii right here too. Remember the uh, rosaceae? Almost looks like a yarrow with those leaves. But then you see that uh, peduncle come up. You can see it's almost about the flower right there. Is it? I, I can't tell. I don't know how it's doing it if it is. Very interesting plant community here. Already interesting. We haven't even seen our target plant yet. And look at this weird bastard. Ariagonum. Ariagonum ovalifolium looks like. Look at those leaves. Look at those. Look at those tiny leaves. Blue, woolly, suns up a peduncle. It's actually in flower. Like so many uh, buckwheats tend to be during the hot and the dry times of the year. And of course, it's growing on the uh, little barren ash flow. You see a barren area, you're going to probably see a buckwheat. You see a barren area in the west, you're probably going to see a buckwheat there. What are you getting impatient, Jack? I'm hey, I'm working on my own time, okay? We got all the time in the world as far as I'm concerned. That's right. You got your little nook to hang out in, all right? Just uh just be patient. You know, that that smoke is actually acting like a sunscreen. It's pretty nice. Ah, uh, the thistle's not having any trouble going off. Look at it. 
these red ants gonna attack me if uh, once I touch it? Maybe not. I don't know. Oh yeah, they're trying to. Woolly leaves. You can see how this thing avoids being eaten. Very. Uh, it seems to work pretty well for it. Circium aridum. This thing's a pretty rare plant. Only known from three counties in Wyoming. What do? You, what does he find? What did you find over there? Leave it alone. And look at this tiny astrag. Tiny astragalus. Almost looks like a astragalus kentrophyta. But uh, you got these little uh, white flowers, prickly foliage. So it's kind of discarded this, uh, it's evolutionarily discarded long pinnate foliage for something that uh, stays close to the ground because we are in the high and dry. It does get cold as balls here in the winter, but you still got those tiny white pea flowers. Look at that. Money shots. Blue, woolly leaves, and eh, maybe, maybe not woolly. But they certainly got the tiny hairs on them, the tiny trichomes. And what pollinates this thing? Those prickly leaves. Again, prickly leaves. Small matted prickly shit. Small matted pincushion. Look at it. I like these carrots too. Always like a good dry carrot. A good high and dry carrot. There's the fruits. You can see that, that shape to them. They got the ridges. And little ridges on the, uh, kind of got a seam, mul multiple seams. But they're flaky, almost look like oats. Those are the seeds. We're way past flower here. Okay, might, might have to collect some of this. Look at the foliage though. Almost fern-like. Fern-like, waxy, glaucous, no hairs. Glaucous and glabrous. Glaucousandglabrous.com. If there was a porn site called glaucousandglabrous.com, I would sign up for it. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. Okay, it would all just be... Uh, desert carrots maybe a couple waxy desert asters probably some desert brassicas as well you know would you guys do me a favor and just download like a, a geologic time scale app so you know what the shit i'm talking about when i'm when i say oligocene or eocene or mesozoic or any of that shit please you'd be doing us all a favor you'd be doing yourself a favor giving yourself some context you'll piss off the evangelicals who are dumb enough to believe the earth is only six thousand years old you know, I really shouldn't deride people. To each their own, right? To each their own. You want to believe goofy shit? That's fine. I'm sure I believe some goofy shit. Anyway, I say that because we are on Oligocene sediments. Oligocene volcanic ash sediments, okay? It's roughly 30 million years ago, okay? You get the Eocene, which is older, then you go Oligocene, which is younger, then you go Miocene, which is younger than that. Miocene ended about 5 million years ago. So we're on Oligocene sediments of the split rock and a white river formation. And growing on these ash sediments, these tophaceous sediments, is our target plant. A plant that only occurs in two populations endemic to the state of Wyoming. This is Yermo xanthocephalus. Look at that. Look at that. A fucking rare plant if there ever was one. Ah! So anyway, the genus name Yermo, uh, in Spanish, Yermo means uh, wilderness. It means desolate desolate ass area okay and uh looking at this you can see why they called it that we are in a desolate ass area okay no service no trucks there's not much out here okay even on the road which i had to hike in from you know i was only seeing one truck every 10 minutes and that's that's something you can't get that much you can't get that these days you can't get that desolation because there's people everywhere hashtag wanderlust hashtag van life Hashtag, uh, we're all packed ass to neck. Anyway, speaking of uh, northwestern Wyoming, that's where you see a lot of that. You know, you see these, especially Jackson Hole, beautiful areas, but very culturally depraved too. Lots of wealth, very, uh, it's it's a monoculture up there. And there's a lot of money. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying, I don't even want to go into it shitting on it, but I just, it's some place I would rather not be. Traffic jams, I'm glad people are getting out, but, uh, the resort thing is not my style. Anyway, I digress. Look at this goddamn plant. When I first saw this plant, I thought to myself, oh my God, that looks like one of my favorite uh, members of the sunflower family that you see in a prairie. Okay, the genus Arnoglossum. Look at those phyleries, those keeled phyleries. You got five phyleries right there, five involucral breaks. Look at that waxy foliage. Okay, also looks like Arnoglossum. Arnoglossum was formerly known as Cacalia. Okay, and indeed, this is very closely related to Arnoglossum. 
but onoglossum occurs quite some distance away from here, all right? Maybe 800 miles, maybe 500 miles, a long fucking way away, all right? Arnoglossum plantagenium is a wonderful plant you get in the Midwestern prairies, and here is a relative of it adapted to the high and dry. So they share a common ancestor. How'd this get over here? Again, once again, plants connect us to geologic time, to geology, etc. okay? So at some point, this and Arnoglossum, Yermo and Arnoglossum shared a common ancestor. We're going into the biogeography dungeon now. And, uh, you know, maybe when the climate was a little bit different, they, uh, you know, that common ancestor was more widespread. Then as the climate changed, the West began to dry out. Okay, roughly uh, last, last five or six million years, the West began to dry out, maybe a little bit before that. Okay. That guy, uh, uh, David Axelrod used to, uh, Used to study all the biogeography, don't you? Anyway, the West dried out, and each species adapted uh, to its uh, respective habitat, okay? This one adapting to the hot and the dry, and also the brutally cold winters. You can see we're, we're it's in this little blowout right here, which probably accumulates a lot of snow. Remember, Wyoming's the place where they got those wooden slat fences along the highway to prevent the snow drifts from blowing onto the freeway and with the shit blowing trucks everywhere. This is incredible. There's one, one, another one, but they're flowering. Well, they're almost about to flower. How do they do that? How do you flower in the hottest time of the year? Members of Asteraceae, the sunflower family, can do that. Oh, this kind of looks like basalt. It kind of looks like basalt. Feels like it too. Feels very heavy. A little bit more iron in that than you'd see in a, a, some of your uh, more felsic rocks, felsic extrusive igneous rocks. Anyway, look at that. Uh, it's just about done flowering, just about finishing up. But again, look at those yellow filaries. Look at the waxiness, the waxy leaves, the venation. This is a goddamn arnoglossum, basically. But it's growing where it shouldn't be, in the high desert of central Wyoming. Look right here, we got an Areogonum brevicol, looks like the rabbit buckwheat. Brevicol, short stock, short flowering stock. You could see why they call it that. Then over here you got the xanthisma with those spiny, somewhat spiny leaves. But the flora here is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not too, uh, not too abundant. These barren areas. Look at that, just looking like little, looking like lily leaves almost poking up from that soil. You got quite a few. Seems like a robust population for a plant that only grows in two places in the world. And then uh, growing right next to it, we got another little matted aster, another little matted plant. Looks like a Stenotus acaulis. There's those leaves. Almost the current rose, that's not very hairy. Maybe they got tiny hairs on them, but you can't see. Another Physaria right there. Got some Oreo carrier too. I just seen an Oreo carrier. Where the hell did it go? So how did a plant whose nearest relative, evolutionarily speaking, grows in the prairies, a much more mesic environment, 800 miles away, how did it get here? These are the, these are the things I like thinking about. These are the things that sometimes keep me up at night and get me a little excited. You know, how do they connect this to deep time? Thinking about these things, how does it connect this to deep time? Understanding how the landscape changed, how plants evolved, how species dealt with those changes, with climatic changes, with volcanic eruptions, with tectonic forces. Ah, oh, it's amazing. The biogeography dungeon is vast and exciting. Never gets old, never gets old. And all these fields are connected. You know, geology, chemistry, botany, physics. Look at that. Just, just coming out right out the bare ground, right out the bare ashy ground.
Now, that's kind of a bummer. Not much seed set, which is actually what I read in uh, one of the papers on this plant. Not much seed set, so they're not getting pollinated for some reason. You can see the pappus sticking out. This is in the Senecio tribe of the composite family. Oh, maybe these, these aren't done yet. But the ones that are done, are those good seeds? I can't tell. Yeah, maybe. No, nah, maybe not. So the pappus helps the seed get around. But again, it doesn't occur anywhere else except here in one other spot. And they have looked for it. They've done extensive surveys. Probably got to have a pretty deep taproot to be able to grow on this stuff. Just You're just banking on that snow. That snow to accumulate in the winter and keep that ground moist deep underneath. There's that cerium again. You know, I really like what the wildfire smoke is doing for my lighting. It's also mitigating that uh, heat of that sun a little bit, which is also very pleasant because it's about 85 degrees right now. Just before noon. You could see they got a they got a weather station out here from uh, University of Wyoming. That's good. So they're monitoring this site. It needs to be monitored. Hopefully they're trying to propagate this plant as well. You can see you got a few more growing right there. One more growing right there. Rather healthy one, robust one. But uh, again, sporadically occurring and uh, not at all common anymore. We've kind of tapered off, you know. And it's, I bet the further out you go, the less you see of them because they got competition from the grasses and the sagebrush. So they need this barren habitat. A nice member of the uh, Oro Bankaceae right here. The paintbrush family. Stealing! It's a thief! A partial parasite! Look at those bracts. Look at those elongated bracts. Lacy bricks almost. Dare I say lacy. Ooh. Okay, there you go. You can see I got, got one flowering still. Was able to find one flowering. Those tiny flowers just poking out of those involucres. Okay, that yellow color that you see on uh, most of the plants that we've been seeing. Those aren't the flowers. Those are just the phyleries. The actual flower are those tiny things right in there with the corolla lobes, for Christ's sakes. They're only about, I don't know, two or three millimeters long, if that. And this guy's just finishing up. Most of them are done already. You know, I remember the first time I seen uh, Arnoglossum, that plant's relative that grows in the prairies just outside Chicago. You know, I was stoked. What a wonderful plant that is. It's about four feet tall, sometimes six feet tall. And I bet it tastes like hell. So waxy. I bet the secondary chemistry is so pungent, so nasty. Oh, it's so nasty. Oh, but I kind of like it. Again, these are all mostly done flowering. All mostly done. The habit I can't get over how nice the habitat is here. I love the barren exposures. You always find the coolest plants on the barren exposures. That Ariaganum again in all its glory. The rabbit buckwheat, Ariagonum brevicol. Tiny flowers on that guy, and a little uh, spatulate woolly leaves. Yeah, see, not here. Too much competition. Too much competition for it here. You got one. You got one right over there. But other than that, you just got the chrysothamnus and the sagebrush. None of the yermo. A single plant right there, one more over there, one more there. See, they kind of stay close to these blowouts right here. These little uh, divots, these divots in the ashy mesa. There's that cerium again, that thistle, just covered in the ants. Oh, they're mining aphids up top. That's what they're doing right there. Cerium aridum. Got a Facilia histata too. Ooh. Who doesn't love this plant? Silvery leaves, Argophyllus leaves. Well past flower. So what did this landscape look like five million years ago? I bet it wasn't as dry. 
bet it was not as dry. But as the landscape changed, this plant, or this lineage rather, changed with it. Got a deeper taproot, maybe uh, some thicker wax on the leaves to deal with the, uh, the hotter, drier summers. All just a series of chance mutations occurring over a very extensive and protracted amount of uh, geologic time. Geologic and evolutionary time. So that now today, you could still tell this is related to Arnoglossum, the prairie plant, but it's much different. Much different in habit, much different in form, and much different in the landscape in which it grows. Look at that. I love this netted branching pattern that some of these buckwheats get. Look at that. Look at that. Super glabrous stems. Super glabrous stems. Super white woolly leaves. And just the tiniest flowers. Okay, but still important to the pollinators when nothing else is blooming. Relatively large seeds. Didn't even have to split this open. They're just the... Uh, the phyleries are just kind of dehissing, just coming apart. So you can see how large those akines are. Maybe maybe eight or nine millimeters long, but relatively juicy, relatively robust. And they got that pappus on top of them. So it looks like these, like this plant is going to produce fertile seed, which is a good sign. Look at it. They're over there. They're just, they're just staring directly at me. And they're actually using the umbrella I set up for them. I'm so proud of them. I wonder why this thing doesn't grow on these uh, these little ash hills, these little ash mounds. There's one over there, but they're mostly just at the base of the mesa. And that other population, I think, is like 10, 10 or 12 miles away. Oh, look, we got some Toxicoscordian. Way past done. Death Camus. Melanthiaceae. Order of Liliales, the order of lilies. There's all that seed. Yeah, I just helped it get around. There's quite a few of those uh, Yermos right here. There's that rose with the frilly foliage. The yarrow-like foliage. Ivesia. Look at that. It's pretty. You know, this one's actually doing, it's doing well. Full flower. A lot of the, what, a lot of the other ones we've seen on those ashy hills weren't, weren't uh, going off. Not yet. How's it, how's it flowering right now, though? Anytime you see a plant flowering at this time of year, how the shit does it do it? How deep does that taproot go? Must have a really uh, efficient way of preventing transpiration, preventing water loss out of those stomata. Look at the look at all the hair on those leaves. You could see how. You could see how it does it. Tiny leaves and they're just covered in little trichomes. Five petaled flowers. What's the calyx look like? Look at those bracts, little uh, pointed bracts on the bottom of that thing. Desert roses. Desert rosaceae. You know, the rose family really has some interesting members in it. Okay, especially if you get down to the Andes, down in South America, high elevation, wild shit. And look at it, you can see that Thermopsis just making a little colony. That's all the same plant. All the same root. Who knows why it chose uh, that uh, pattern that it did. <laughs> Who knows? And there's a, there's a Yermo growing in some horse shit. You know, I've read that these soils being volcanic are pretty high in potassium, but pretty lacking in nitrogen. Okay, but the, you know, if, as for why this plant grows here just according to soil chemistry, you know, the, the research that has been done has yielded no, no results. So it doesn't really have to do with soil. And the other site, the soil is quite different from the soil chemistry here. So that's the entire distribution of this population. One of two populations. You're looking at all of it. Just right at the base of this mesa and the barren exposures of volcanic ash. Oh, here's a rather robust one. Look at this. Look at this massive bastard. 
about a foot across, a foot tall. Multiple peduncles. You got about, what is that, eight peduncles coming up from that perennial root. How deep does that root go? Pretty deep. You got a couple more right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But again, just stick into the barren areas where they're not going to get uh, any competition. Probably a lot of swallows up there. Probably some bats, too. See, there's one that decided not to flower this year. So there you go. There's a, there's half the world population of Yermo xanthocephalus. A Wyoming endemic. A rare plant and a beautiful one at that, might I add. From the Senecio tribe of the sunflower family. Most closely related to Arnoglossum which is a much uh, bigger plant that, that occurs in the uh, prairies just outside Chicago, as well as uh, other areas uh, further east of here. So waxy. You feel it? It feels rubbery. Can you, can you listen to that? You get kind of like a waxy. Maybe like that, you know, just in case you're having trouble uh, envisioning uh, what that sound might be like. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you got some out of that. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Fucking gypsum, man. Ah, oh, there's always so much good shit on it. Even in southern Wyoming. Look at the ants on this aeromogeny, just, just ready to defend their aphids. Little matted, little matted spiky bastards. Look at that, the remnants of a giant open pit mine. Wyoming's got some banded iron formations too, some nice two billion year old racks not as pretty as the ones in Michigan but uh but here you go this was a massive iron mine in the 60s guess they shut it down I think in the 80s ah remnants of the great oxygenation event you remember that look at that hints at its sedimentary origin you know, get the texture of paper breaks so easily. Look at this. Ah, oh, to go back to the Precambrian. Oh, not even, this is older than that. The Paleozoic. Holy shit. Look at all the, look at all the iron in that. And there it is, the blowout penstemon. The fucking, the cows are just, I can't, I can't tell you how much I hate cows. Nothing personal against them. I'm sure they're all very fine people. Just fucking, oh God, I'm obnoxious. Anyway, there's the, uh, there's the blow up pencil. I mean, look at those leaves. So waxy, so glaucous. You could see how it's adapted to dunes. Look at that. You'd think it'd be dead. It's that root probably goes another four feet into that soil. Well, oh, maybe two, maybe two feet. But you could see it's doing fine. Total, almost totally uprooted and totally fine. Past flowering, but uh, look at that foliage. Ooh, ooh. Look at that, just this one plant though. 175 mile disjunct from the nearest population in Nebraska. And it's already a pretty rare plant, but you could see, look at that. Adapted to its shifting dune habitat. And look at those bracts at the base of uh, what was that uh, beautiful pink inflorescence. What if it's still a fucking cool plant. I don't care if it's not flowering or not. Still nice to be out here and see this shit. Holy fuck. Just one single plant, though. The, re the rest of the plants are just uh, Ladyana. Ladyana lanceolata. There's probably some more up there. There we go. There's two. There's one. Uh, where the fuck did it go? Oh, over there. And then there's one right here. It's funny. I look, I look on the map on the satellite, and uh, 
at the time the satellite photo was taken, there was nothing here. This was an empty dune field, like right out there. It's so you could see they shift from year to year. Yeah, I hope this thing makes it. Hope it's around in uh, 50 years. Stiff leaves, pretty waxy. Probably an extensive root system and multiple branches all from the same root. Like many dune plants. Look at that, just a single plant. <laughs> that's, that's it. What the fuck? Right there. You see that? Just a single penstem in it. Why? Why is it so fucking rare? Is it cattle? Did cattle do this? It's just my, it's just my inner animosity coming out. I'm not going to bullshit myself. It wasn't the cows. They didn't do it this time. I'm being unfair. Look at it, though. Look at those. The leaves that... Sub Look at those. Those aren't even leaves. They're like giant bracts now. God, it must have been a banger when it was going off. Oh. Look at that. See, you got seedlings. Tiny seedlings. Actually, this is probably not a seedling because there's multiple stems. It's probably coming up from the same root. You know, for every... It feels like for every... 1500 Ladyana lanceoladas. Every 1500 of these peas, probably more than that, you get like one small penstemon. It's amazing. They always see you before you see them. God, I love pronghorn. Not true antelope, most closely related to giraffes. <laughs>